coming, despite the beautiful weather. Thank you um, for inviting us to this festival. Um, I'm very unused. I, I usually don't moderate, so I, I, I hope I'll, I'll cope. And also when I found out that I was, I was very much looking forward to speaking with Olivier Guez, whom I welcome here on the stage. It's great Thank that you. you're here. I was very happy that I would be able to talk to you on stage because I think it's very interesting to talk to you. Only when I heard that we will talk about Europe, I pe became a bit insecure because I'm a very, I mean, I love Europe, but I'm kind of un, an, I'm an uninspired European. And I think it's great to talk to you because I think you are an inspired European and you actually have something to say about Europe. And um, that's why I'm very curious about this talk. And today you told me you are not a pro-European, but a European. What, what, what do you mean by that? Yeah, just a European. Hi, everybody. Um, <clears throat> well, it's, it's quite easy. I, I was born in, uh, in Strasbourg, so just at the border with Germany. And, um, and I felt very European since the very beginning. Even if, I mean, my first encounter with Europe was, uh, was a shock, actually. Uh, in the late 70s in Strasbourg, uh, there used to be a swimming pool just at the opposite of my grandparents' place where, where I was brought up. And uh, they destroyed the swimming pool, in fact, to, to build the Council of Europe. So my first relationship to Europe was a hate relationship. They destroyed my swimming pool. And um, after that, um, I grew up in the 80s in Strasbourg, and uh, Europe was everywhere. I mean, Mitterrand and Kohl <coughs> used to meet um, extremely often in Strasbourg. Strasbourg was definitely one of, or maybe the capital of Europe, mm -hmm. not only symbolically or because of the European Parliament or the Council of Europe, which is not a European institution, or it's different, it's not related to the EU. But I mean, the, the whole atmosphere of the of the city in the 80s when I was a kid was completely pro-European, and there was there was something in the air. There is I I don't know the 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 perfume of a, of a big adventure, in fact, and uh, of course the proximity of Germany. I mean, for me to go, I then after they closed the swimming pool, I went swimming in, in Germany because I mean, Kiel is just 10 minutes from where I used to live as a as a kid, so th that was something which was natural. I mean, I, I went to Paris when I was mm -hmm. already 15 or 16 the first time. And uh, also geographically, um, what I told you this morning uh, at breakfast, Milan is closer to Strasbourg than Paris, for instance. So basically my whole geography as a kid was European. Uh, I remember also um, a trip we made in, uh, I mean, my old family. I, I had a grandfather who had uh, Czech origin. And before he died, he wanted to to know more things to know more things about his family. And I remember that was in 1988. And so we went. My father had a long Peugeot break, and we all went together to Prague to find something uh, something about the family. And we didn't discover anything. I mean, Prague was like uh, a stone cemetery at the time. I mean, with a uh, secret police everywhere. There was no cafe, no restaurant, nothing at all. But this has marked my. Um, my identity very strongly. And one year after, of course, uh, the wall of Berlin fell. And I mean, I was 15, and for me, that was the adventure of my generation. And did you, I read that you lived in a couple of European cities. Did mm -hmm. you deliberately decide, I want to actually explore Europe? And because you lived in Bruges, in mm -hmm. London, in mm -hmm. Paris, mm -hmm. Berlin, Berlin, Rome, Rome now. now. Yeah. Um, I think, again, it was natural because I didn't have this strong relationship to France. I mean, when you, you're brought up in, in... So you're not French, you're European. Would you say that? Yeah, we'd say that I'm more European than French. More European. I mean, I, I like the French language. This is language I, I write. And it's an amazing language. And, of course, the French culture is, uh, is extremely interesting. But I would say that for many reasons, because of Strasbourg, because the history of part of my family... Um, because of my experiences, I was always attracted more to, to Europe outside of France. I mean, I feel more at ease, I don't know, in Munich or in Berlin than in Toulouse. I have no connection to Toulouse, for instance. And during the, um, uh, during the, the COVID, I had to stay in Bretagne for four months. 
And for me, it was like being in a completely foreign country. I had no relationship to Bretagne. I never came back since. So, um, yeah, this was a natural relationship to Europe. And I think uh, football also played a role. Oh. I remember when I was a kid, I was fascinated by the, the European Cups. And I remember the first rounds where you had 30, 60 teams. I was fascinated by all these names. I mean, the Scandinavians and all these strange, uh, remote Eastern European clubs at the time of communism in Italy and so on and so on. So, so basically, I couldn't say, but I, I, was, I was born European. Uh, Milan Kundera said, Europe is a maximum of diversity in a, in a minimum space. Mm -hmm. And um, that, is, that is, of course, the strength of Europe. And, but the problem then probably would be, how do you create, what, what is European? Can you create European, a European narrative? I mean, obviously, we have a new European narrative, but your work also seems to reflect that. And in 2020, you published, um, you organized and published this anthology of European mm -hmm. literature of 24 authors? 27, 20 one per member state, yeah. How many countries are we in Europe? 27. 27, yeah. okay. Did you find in this anthology common themes? Were they, was, it, was, it a, was it one story or is, does Europe tend to fragment? Well, yeah, I found out some uh, common themes. Basically, um, it was two years ago for the, 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 the French EU presidency, I asked uh, 27 authors, one per member state, to write a story about a place uh, in their own country which has a strong relationship to European culture, European society, oh. European history. And they were all free, and they were diff writers from very various generations. And... And in fact, first you could see what was in what was what is very interesting with this text that they were written during the summer of twenty one. So basically, someone in a few years uh, would be interested to understand what was the psyche of Europe before the war in Ukraine. This is very interesting because you can you can really feel what was mm -hmm. going on. Mm -hmm. I mean, at least for these writers, but I think it says a lot because they are twenty seven. Uh, you could see, you could feel, you could read uh, the great divide between Eastern and Western Europe among the writers. The Eastern writers, most of them, or I would say even all of them, wrote something which has a relationship to either the Shoah, the Holocaust, or to communism. I mean, they had, in all their texts, they had a very strong relationship to history and the drama of history, oh. the drama of Eastern Europe. On the other end, uh, the Western European writers, they picked some other issues. But what was interesting, in fact, that through the, um, the places they chose, um, there were lots of what I would say the lieu commun of Europe, the common places of Europe. So basically, you had text about artist colonies, you had text about uh, seaside resorts, about uh, stations, mm. about museums, about archaeological sites. Basically, the kind of thing that you find everywhere in Europe, more or less, which are the, the, the common landscapes of Europe. And uh, so you could feel the difference, the, the relationship to history, because all of the writers, even the, the youngest writers from uh, Eastern Europe were something around 45, they had a direct relationship to the drama of history. I, I remember I spent a lot of time <coughs> with uh, the Slovak writer uh, who lives in Bratislava, <coughs> and this guy is just a bit younger than me, he was born in uh, 76, but he could perfectly remember the dictatorship what was Czechoslovakia under the, the communist regime. On the other end, none of the writer of Western Europe had a direct relationship to this to the drama of history. They were the sons or the great sons, the great daughters mm. of something they never knew. And you could feel this, uh, this great divide um, between the, the two parts of the, of the continent, I would say. I mean, for example, your work is very much concerned with history, even though you're from yeah. Western Europe. But I mean, I'm talking now about the Mengele book and mm -hmm. also about your uh, screenplay for which you received the German Film Award. Mm -hmm. It's a very good award uh, about um, also a it's case that is related to mm -hmm. you know, the crimes of, of uh, National Socialism. For you, are these German stories or are these also European stories that these well, like concerning yourself with, 
this German form of fascism and how to deal with this German form of fascism? It is, of course, German stories, uh, but it's also, of course, European stories. Um, yeah, I, I spent something like more than 10 years, in fact, what I wrote about German history. There was a book about the history of the Jews in Germany after the war, I mean, until the, the beginning of the 21st century. Then one of the chapters of this book became the basis of the of the screenplay mm -hmm. of Der Stadt gegen Fritz Bauer. Mm -hmm. um, and then from Der Stadt gegen Fritz Bauer, because we were telling the story of uh, how Fritz Bauer uh, discovered Eichmann in Argentina, um, I had to read lots of things about Argentina and also the, and of course, all these uh, Nazi cycles in, uh, in Argentina. And at the time when I was writing the book about the Jews, um, L'impossible retour de Heimkehr der Unerwünschte. Oh. Um, this is a history of the two Germanies and then of Germany from a kind of a victim perspective. I wanted to understand why Jews, some Jews decided to stay in Germany, to come back or to settle in Germany. And at the time I already had the idea to write the same story from a criminal perspective. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know who to pick, in fact. Mm -hmm. And because of the work on Fritz Bauer and the story mm -hmm. in Argentina, I I didn't discover Mengele, but I thought mm -hmm. that the story of Mengele was extremely interesting. So to go back to your question, of course it is German, uh, it's German history. But for me, it's maybe even more, not more, but at least also as much as German history, it's European history. I mean, for sure, fascism is not only no, in this a problem in Germany. For sure, but in the sense that Basically, I think the, the greatest question after the war was how can you rebuild a society after what happened in Europe? Mm -hmm. Not only between 39 and 45, but from 1914 till 1945. I mean, this second uh, 30 years war. I mean, Europe was the, the most, the richest, the most developed, the most sophisticated continent at the beginning of the 20th century not even 50 years after, it was a ruin. Mm. So how do you rebuild a society? And of course, because Germany went that far and was responsible of so many crimes, it was very interesting to see how the Germans did this. But the same question occurred in France with Vichy, what, what France did with the Vichy people, for instance. How did France uh, look at its past during from 1940 till 1944. How was France looking at it? Well, it took some time. It took yes. some time, but like in Germany, basically a common feature um, also in Italy is a bit different, Austria is even uh, also different. But in Germany and in France, what people did, in fact, was to start looking at the past oh. and what happened exactly, who did what. When the generation of the war went um, retired, in fact. So basically, also because of the context of the Cold War, no one wanted to destabilize the society. I mean, if you take oh. the German society, I mean, it went that far, that's the judicial system, the university system, the medicine system, everybody was involved, more or less, oh. directly. If you really wanted justice at the time, you would have to destroy all these institutions. And no one wanted this. So basically, when people went retired, then suddenly, I think it's not a, it's not a surprise, or it's not, they, they, they really started, I mean, there were lots of historians, not so many historians, some historians, of course, started working on this in the 40s and the 50s, but there was no echo. And of course, it's related to 67, 68, everywhere. But basically, I mean, the whole story, I mean, the whole thing started to, I mean, to, to reach a wide audience, in the 70s, in the late 70s. And what I discovered when I read the, the, when I wrote the book about the, the Jews in Germany, that it was this Hollywood sitcom, Holocaust, which was a huge shock in Germany. And people started oh. to talk because when you read a, an historian book, I mean, it's very abstract. You have figures, six million people. What does it mean, six, mi six million people were assassinated? But Holocaust was very different. <coughs> it was the story of a family. So people could identify themselves. Oh. 
And it was a huge shock in all over Europe. I mean, in France, for instance, um, there were two main, I would say, main steps at the time. The first one was the film of Max Ophuls, Le Chagrin et la Pitié. That was a shock because he went to interview lots of Vichy people, were completely um, assimilated and there was no big suit in, in France. And for instance, Maurice Papon was the Paris prefet in the early 60s and he worked with uh, De Gaulle and he worked with uh, Giscard d'Estaing. He was even the interior ministry of uh, Giscard d'Estaing in the early 70s. So people wouldn't talk about this. And the second one was a book uh, by uh, an American historian, Robert Paxton. He was a young historian, La France de Vichy, and it was a huge shock. Um, so basically, I wanted to, to, to work on this um, because I think it's a European feature and it's part of my own history. Oh. So, um, so I dedicated these this 10 years to, oh. to these topics. How do you think Europe is dealing with its fascist roots? Do you think, because we have the... We talked yesterday about the new populism. Um, you see the European idea in danger, because I also read in The Guardian, your text, that you see Europe as a place where you can move freely about and you love traveling in your car, for example. You're on the road nine months a year. You see a danger to this? You think the borders could go up again? or? I think there are different things. Um, <clears throat> Europe is the only continent, in fact, who, who digged into its past as, as so much, in fact. And 60, the late 60s, I mean, the, the, this new generation, the generation of the son of the daughters who decided to rebel against the fathers, the uncles, what have you done, where have you been, and so on and so on. I think I didn't live it, but I think it was a kind of magical moment because oh. it was a moment of truth. But then what happened is, uh, is fascinating, that the, the Europeans uh, started to deconstruct everything. You deconstruct everything, one thing after the other. I mean, there was the war first, and then there was uh, the colonial past, and then everything, and one... Basically, n Europeans don't believe in many things, except oh. in themselves, or the, the kind of consumption society we live in. And, and uh, the fact is that... Because we Europeans uh, are the only ones who have digged into our past so much, it's also extremely dangerous in the world we live in. The Russians, they haven't done anything. Now they rewrite, they've been rewriting their story for 20 years. So there, when, is, there is just one, there, there is this <coughs> aggressivity all around. I mean, mm. Turkey is pretty aggressive. You have Islamism, which is extremely aggressive. You have China, you even have, I mean, the United States is a strange ally. It's an ally when there is Joe Biden, and it's, uh, it's difficult to define uh, if Trump comes back or another one. Other people would be like Trump, will think like that, will think that Europe is, is not so, so important anymore. So this, the fact that we, we dealt so much with our past, that we know so much the many mistakes, the horrors that the Europeans have inflicted to themselves and to the other parts of the world, is fantastic and also extremely dangerous. That's one point. So it's very difficult to... Um, But do you think that's actually a defining cultural phenomenon to look at your own past and try to, try to reflect on it? You think I think it's a, very a deeply European I think it's, raid? Or I think it's extremely important mm. to know who we are, what we've done. <laughs> But I think that's also the positive things. This is something which is missing in Europe, that we know a lot, we can know a lot about the mistakes we made, but what is lacking is a kind of also a positive history of Europe because Europe has done amazing things. There's a European spirit which is incredible. Yeah, that's why and I like your enthusiasm, enthusiasm about it because that is absolutely absolutely needed. And um, but there are not many people share it. I have to say, oh, yeah. <laughs> but um, so on one end, it, it's fantastic that we manage, in fact, to to look at our history so much and to, to know exactly what we've done. And on the other end, it's also extremely dangerous in the world we live in. And what do you think are the mistakes that are happening in Europe right now that maybe lead to this skepticism of many Europeans towards this, the European idea? I think because, I mean, there are many reasons, but for me, it's because the, the EU, the way it has been built, 
has never tried to to develop and to um, communicate uh, a common history of Europe to to its citizens. Mm -hmm. Basically, when the the European project started in the early fifties, uh, it kind of started as a German French project in a way. And Benelux oh. and Italy. I mean, this kind of Carolingian, mm. former Carolingian uh, empire. Um, it, has a, it had a very modest approach. I mean, after what happened between 1914 and Mostly 1945, it was industrial. Oh. So basically, instead of producing cannons and weapons uh, on your own, just share all of these and exchange them. It was a modest thing. And I think at the time it was a very good approach. But no one at the time would speak about a European culture or European civilization. I mean, Europe can, European culture or European civilization just led to Auschwitz mm. five years before, ten years before. So basically, this approach was the right one at the time. But I think we missed a very strong opportunity in the late 80s, early 90s, with the fall of the Berlin Wall. Mm. I mean, if you read, for instance, you mentioned Kundera, but Kundera is not the only one. But all these intellectuals from Central Europe, they were saying, we are Europeans. We belong to the same civilization. We belong to the same society. We belong to the same history. We have nothing to do with Russia. We are not the East. We are the center of Europe. So there was a very strong cultural aspect uh, in this. And you think that momentum was missed? Completely missed. Mm. Completely missed. Because... I mean, for, for various reasons, but, um, and I think the left and the right are both responsible. The left at the time, still today, a bit differently, but at the time, you couldn't say European civilization, European culture. They were afraid of themselves, in fact. They, they were ashamed. So they didn't want to touch this. The very idea of just to define a common European uh, culture or civilization I remember, for, in, for instance, the debates in 2005 for the, you know, the EU constitution. Mm. The French didn't want to put in the preamble of the constitution that um, Europe was a um, Jewish Christian tradition. For me, it's crazy. I mean, it's not because, I mean, if you wander around Europe, if you go to a museum in Europe, of course, Europe was a Jewish Christian mm. continent for centuries and centuries. That doesn't mean that you're going to start a new crusade or to impose to the, the new immigrants uh, to be Jewish or to be Christian. But just this very idea of identity. And the, 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 the left mm. in France refused this. So the left had, were afraid, was afraid of themselves. The right at the time, late, 90, late 80s, early 90s, <clears throat> that was the heyday of neoliberalism. Everything was, uh, I mean, to buy or to sell. That was the, the beginning of the globalization after Reagan, oh, after Thatcher. Yeah. So everything was a market. So basically, all the Central European countries, if they wanted to join the EU, which happened in 2004, they had to compare to a series of economic reforms, financial reform, judicial reforms, and that's fine. But the very core, the, in fact, the sexiness mm. of belonging to Europe was left apart mm. completely. And I think it was a great mistake because what people couldn't know at the time, but what happened, I mean, what started in the late 90s, early 2000, that globalization, in fact, created a huge identity crisis. People started to get afraid. They, they had the feeling that they would be completely lost in this new kind of globalized economic momentum. And they were asking, and this is when all this populist movement started to grow, in fact, because they had a very simple answer to a very complex question. Who are we in this new globalized world? And I think it was a huge mistake. And But what could have been done differently? I think to try to define this... I mean, there is a transversal, transversal history of Europe. I mean, if you take the history of arts, for instance... There is not a French national history of art or German national. Mm. I mean, it's all transversal. Mm. All the artists moved and then mm. went to Italy and mm. so on, went to the Netherlands and so on and so on. I mean, you have the, the Renaissance history, you have the, the, the Roman, I mean, the Greek, the Roman Empire. Uh, you have this uh, Carolingian thing. Then so you, you think have there the should reform. be mu much more European studies to be exactly. Done I mean, just diversity. all the kids of Europe. I think. My, to my point of view, I mean, it should have at least one hour in common. 
just to feel that they belong to something bigger mm -hmm. than their city or the nation state. And the nation state is, is too small today. I mean, we all yeah. we have all understood this. And I think it was a, a huge mistake. And, and I remember during the Greek crisis, a bit more than 10 years ago, I mean, the Germans were asked to pay for some bills of the Greeks. I mean, you don't pay the bills of someone who is not part of your family. Mm. And if you have to have this, if you want to have this family feeling, you, pay. you, have, you have to share something. Mm. You have to, at least to have the feeling that you belong to something in common. And Germany refused. Germany refused because they didn't feel very close to the Greeks. Mm. Why should you? Mm. I mean, if I ask you now, I have some debts. Will you pay for my debts if we have no... I mean, we met, we had a nice conversation, we met a few other time. But if you don't feel that you're part of my family, that you, I really need you and that you think it's, it's worth helping, helping me, you wouldn't do that. And this, this is what also this idea of a common culture, mm. this is what it would be so useful, in fact, to have, to have this feeling. Yeah. And the things changed a bit with the war in Ukraine. Suddenly, for the first time since a very long time, we had the feeling that we belong to something bigger than our nation state. So you mentioned Russia a couple of times. You don't think Russia is a European country? Well, the Russia of Vladimir Putin is not at all a European country. It's, uh, well, we so built... So the war against Ukraine is, in a way, a war of Putin against Europe? It's, it not a, it's not a war within Europe, it's a war against Europe. I mean, the war started in 2014 because the Ukrainians uh, did the Euromaidan and they decided to, they wanted to be a European country. And as soon as it started, I mean, uh, Russians, the Russians came uh, to Russia, to, to the Ukraine with the Crimea and the Donbass and so on. I mean, w the Ukrainians have been in war for 10 years now. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a war of values. It's a war of, uh, I don't like this. Well, why not? Yeah, it's a kind of a war of civilization. Usually the European continent goes to the Ural Mountains. Sorry? The, the European continent is considered to reach the... Yeah, ge geographically, for sure, yeah. So Moscow would be Europe a European city. Well, Moscow is technically, geographically, a European city. Hmm. But the regime of Putin is exactly what the Europeans, the opposite of the, what the Europeans have been doing since 1945. It's kind of what the Europeans, especially the Germans, have been doing before. It's like the, the ugly face of European fascism is now grinning back and attacking Europe. Uh, Completely. I mean, yeah, Putin is a, is a, is a fascist dictator, for, for sure. I have no doubt about this. I mean, I sometimes think that maybe Russia should be embraced more, but I guess with fascist dialogue is impossible. I think that's what 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 you have to learn when you deal with fascism. It, it, it's not. It's it's. Yeah, I mean, you don't. Talk, I mean, it's impossible to talk with a dictator, mm. and uh, that was the mistake the the French, the Germans, Obama. Uh, you think they talk too long. I think they or didn't... Or, or believe that talk would be helpful. I mean, I've been thinking a lot about Angela Merkel since two years. I don't understand what she did, to be honest with you. Uh, in terms of... Poli poli uh, poli in terms of many okay. things, actually. In terms of defense, in terms of uh, foreign policy, and especially the relationship to Russia. I mean, Angela Merkel was born in Eastern Germany. She knew the system. She, she knew exactly what is a KGB guy. And Putin is above all a KGB guy. And sh I remember I read an interview of her in that site, I think at the end of 22. And she said that after her first meeting, you know, with a dog, she understood who Putin was. Okay, great for her. But what did she do after that? I mean, she offered Germany to Russia. I mean, Germany became completely dependent. Uh, I mean, for, its, uh, for the gas, for everything, everything uh, we know now. I don't understand. And the French did this, made the same mistakes, and Obama also. I mean, when he, when he refused, in fact, I mean, the, you remember about Syria. Obama said there is a red line, mm. and if they cross the red line, we'll go. Mm. He didn't go. Mm. Putin understood at that time, for him, that the West was extremely weak. Mm. And uh, so there was a yeah, series of huge mistakes with that. I mean, a dictator like Putin only understands the language of force, unfortunately. But does this mean that you would also advocate Europe to have a, a military, a, a different, a different form, a, a president, like a much stronger political structure, 
Well, I think we don't have many other options. Mm. I mean, what will happen maybe, I don't know, in nine months if Trump comes back or someone else? I mean, now the, 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 the whole Republican Party is, uh, has been following Trump the last eight years. They are isolationist, and for them, Europe is not important. Mm. They want to deal with Russia. They have other things to do with China. I mean, what are we going to do? Um, I mean, for me, it's no. It's a very French idea for a very long time because the French don't like to be dependent on the Americans and, mm. and so on. But mm. I think now, I mean, I was in Germany last week. I read the newspapers. Now you, you're thinking about a nuclear weapon, which would have been impossible to talk about in Germany just two, mm. two and a half years ago. Uh, so yeah, I think it's uh, we don't have uh, we, we don't have any other option. Mm. I mean, the problem is somehow the structure still. Like, I, I somehow don't identify with Ursula von der Leyen. I somehow think she's not my president. Your, your type of, uh, <laughs> of president. Um, what is very weird with Europe that, uh, as you said, I mean, uh, I, I lived in different European countries and I spent lots of time in Germany. And uh, before the First World War, European culture, for instance, was much more integrated that European culture today. I mean, when when you look at just, um, you know, news on TV, mm. and then you have the, the weather forecast, mm. you still have the national boundaries. Mm. But I mean, I was born in Strasbourg. I don't care about the weather in Toulouse. I'm much more interested by the weather, I don't know, in Karlsruhe or the, oh. in Basel. Oh. But uh, strangely, people keep on thinking as member of a national state, and I understand for some reasons, for sure. But this change of scale has not happened yet. And I think, I mean, psychologically for the people, it would be time, in fact, to prepare them to to move to another scale. And because we don't have many other options uh, these days and in the, in the future. So if one thinks that the European identity sh shall be strengthened, as, as you do, and as I do, and probably a lot of us do here what how can it be implemented like what needs to happen like what can we do what do you do do you like what? something like the anthology of literature that's of course something yeah you it's do. a very little stone and but i was surprised in fact that this anthology was not uh, translated for instance it's actually crazy it's for me it's a very strong sign mm. uh, what is not working in europe it only i mean it came out in french it came out in french and only in the netherlands I was in Amsterdam one month ago. I mean, this kind of anthology, I remember when I was around between 15 and 20 in the early 90s, mm. you had lots of books like that. You know, like all these generational writers, they were translated in every European language. This book, I mean, you have Daniel Kehlmann for Germany, you have Sophie Oxanet for Finland, uh, you have Tom Coibin from uh, Ireland, yeah, you, have, uh, you have uh, Krasna Orkai for Hungary, and so on and so on. These are major writers. It's not like second-class writers. This book was only published in the Netherlands. No one in Germany wanted to publish that book because Europe doesn't sell. In Italy, same. Spain, same. And oh. so on and so on. English language, nothing. So for me, it was it's uh, it's a sign, in fact, that and yeah, I, I mean, we need to implement this on many levels. I, I remember, for example, that when I grew up, it was normal that Germans would go to France for like a Schüler Austausch student exchange, and you probably I don't know if you remember that, but I, I mean Strasbourg probably had of course I, uh, I remember. So that was actually quite. Um, I quite mean, the, quite important. The young Germans used to learn French. Some French used to learn German. My first girlfriend was French from a you see? student exchange. So yeah. that was that strengthened the European idea in me, actually. So I think m that would be, for example, a great idea to have more of this exchange with also with other countries. <laughs> that like Germany, when it has to pay a bill for Greece, actually feels like, yes, this is our family, which I always feel when I go to Greece. But maybe the Schäuble never went there. He um, goes to a different place. He goes to Spain. Or I mean, Erasmus is working very well. But Erasmus is still a very, I mean, concerns a very small uh, mm. amount of, uh, of students. Mm. And also, so also, I mean, you have integration problems in more or less every European country. I also thought that Europe could be maybe a solution to this integration. Because, I mean, if you take the example of France, you still have this kind of conflict between former colonized and former colonists. 
I mean, mm. this has not disappeared the last for the last 60 years. But if you change of scale, I mean, a second or third generation doesn't have this love and hate relationship to the French. I mean, to Europe, this would be different. But this is this is not happening. I think the main thing, whatever we talk about culture or um, society, military, whatever. It's a matter of change of scale. The only thing which change of scale is football. Champions League. That works. It works very well. The whole Europe or Eurovision. Yeah. But the rest, but this has nothing to do with the EU. And in the, I remember when I was preparing the, the introduction of the anthology, I mean, so you didn't you get any EU funding for translations everywhere. <laughs> like that would be. I don't know. This is what publishers do. I. Um, but I mean, <coughs> if a German publisher wants to publish this, they could probably. They know it. how to find money yeah. in general. Yeah. You know, you can ask for help, financial support, and whatever. And um, but the EU is so has so much fear of itself. Oh. <coughs> in Brussels, you have a statue, which is supposed to symbolize the idea of the European adventure. Do you know what it is? No. It's a guy, uh, how do you say, somnambule, someone who doesn't, who walks when he sleeps. Schlafwandler, yeah. yeah. Sleep, sleepwalking. So, yeah, exactly, like uh, the book, uh, The Sleepwalkers. Mm. He's a sleepwalker, and he seems to fall, he's about to fall in the void. <laughs> That's the statue in Brussels, which is supposed to symbolize the European mm. adventure. In America, you have the Statue of Liberty, and we have a sleepwalker, <laughs> a very tiny one. Mm. Look at the banknotes, the euro banknotes. What do we have on the banknotes? Abstract stuff. Abstract oh. bridges, yeah, also designed by a computer. Very, very weird. We have yeah. thousands of geniuses in Europe. No. Why I, now, for instance, it would be, it would be kind of interesting. We could organize a kind of you know, internet referendum, who do you want? Of course, the French are more numerous than the Estonians. So the Estonians would have less chance to have an Estonian on the banknotes than mm. the French or the Germans. But still, you know, all these kind of symbolic things, mm. the EU missed them. Consciously. And uh, for me, it's, it's something which is crazy, something which, which doesn't work, in fact, in Europe. Um, you didn't want to talk that much about your new book, but I think it is also connected to Europe, so I just at least want to mention mm -hmm. it, um, because you're in this book, um, can I say the title already? Yeah, yeah. Mes sure. Mesopotamia. You look at what we call now often the, mi the Middle East, mm -hmm. how it actually changed tremendously because of European influence. Do you want mm -hmm. to just briefly yeah. explain what this is about and how this is like how the Middle East and Europe are connected maybe well it's it's a book about the, the British Empire and it's a center on uh, on a very enigmatical figure uh, who was Gertrude Bell Gertrude Bell was a British adventurer uh, an, imp an imperialist lady I thought it was interesting to work on a on a lady who is imperialist mm stick or imperialist and uh, so this lady had the great idea to create the kingdom of Iraq basically she so did that's a European that's creation yes that's I wanted to write something about imperialism mm. but also all the ambiguities I mean these people I mean she was the best friend of Lawrence these people were also extremely interesting I mean, they were so eager to know about everything. She spoke fluent Arabic, fluent Persian. She knew everything about the region, the history, the people. And the, um, so I wanted to, to work about this. And what, I mean, as a, as a novelist, I'm very interested by people who have this hubris. They think they, they can go with this Promethean mm. idea of creating something much bigger than they are. Mengele was a uh, Promethean. I mean, when he was working on the twins, mm. he really thought that he could find the secrets of the twins. Mm. And this lady uh, thought that she could uh, draw the map of the new Middle East and to gather people <coughs> who had never lived together 
Did she actually have a vision that these people now should live together and this creates something yeah. new and beautiful, or did she just not Absol care enough? No, 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 yes, absolutely. I mean, they, they, the Brits created Iraq the way the Europeans, especially the French, created Yugoslavia, for instance, mm. to mix. I mean, they destroyed the old empires, thinking that night's time for nationalities and so on, in fact, to create mini empires, but without any legitimacy. I mean, the Ottoman Empire had a kind of legitimacy. The Austrian-Hungarian had a legitimacy. So this is what the next book is about. But it's mm. also about our, our life, our loves. And I mean, it's a, mm. it's a novel. But it's, I mean, it's based on... I worked on this for, for six years. And it's coming out this fall in France. In right? French, yes, to start with. Mm. Well, I'm very eager to read it. I really can't wait for the German or English translation. Well, Me too, actually. <laughs> So, um, are we also taking questions from the audience? Sure. What's the end of our talk? And I'm also going to, I'm not going to do WhatsApp, I'm just going to check my notes on my phone, so they're on the phone, so don't worry. But questions from the audience? Well, I think it depends what the Europeans want to do of themselves. If they want to, to remain the, the pupil of America, but an America they can't trust anymore, or not completely, or if they accept, I mean, to be part of history. I mean, <coughs> the feeling I have, um, so I'm traveling most of the time all around Europe, I think the dream of most Europeans would be to be like a, a big Swiss, a big Switzerland. Just to be a, aside from history. We're old, we're rich, we're tired, we've been doing lots of good things, bad things, but we just want to retire. I mean, to make some business and to enjoy our barbecues and the seaside and the mountains and so on. This is the dream of most of Europeans. And it's a... not in this, uh, the, the uh, influence uh, of China in Africa and mm -hmm. in America. Uh, how do you see the relation to the influence of, uh, of Europe? In well, the I can, I can tell you as a French. So a second question concerning Qatar or the oil states and Europe in relation to China, Russia and so on. I mean, all these states you're mentioning, they are hungry. They're angry, they want to eat, they want to bite, they want to conquer, they want their revenge, they want whatever reasons. We don't want anything of this. I mean, the, the, um, I mean, we want to do some business, we want to travel, but we are a very peaceful continent, I mean, compared to, to the others. And in Africa, I'm not a specialist of Africa at all, but I just can see that... Um, because of the past and because also of clever manipulations, the French were ousted from most of the African countries the last years. I mean, to be replaced by the Wagner Group. I mean, between uh, a French army officer and a Wagner Group officer, I know who I would pick, even if I'm not a fan of the French officers, but still, there is no comparison. But now they think that the Russians are going to help them, or people think that... Also in Africa, the Chinese are very nice people and they, they, they won't try to exploit their resources. And But the Chinese are, they are so hungry. What so... When you look at the success, oh, when you look at the success of the what you mentioned, the Wagner Group in in Africa, um, so often uh, I hear the the note that um, Russia and Putin doesn't really have much to offer for developing countries, but I think he's a lot to offer, uh, and, and this, is, this is very uh, um, this model of managing. Um, managing a place, a country, by this uh, brutal um, system of, um, um, of this very uh, um, 
corrupt and small and brutal elite, <coughs> and um, and that is maybe some uh, this a model with uh, with much less um, rights and and perspectives for the great majority and but that is on the on the other hand it's also mm, it's much cheaper to to manage a country entry a country and it might be attractive for some regimes for some countries so um, 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 so that and that is uh, when when you compare that with the European model, then it takes it's very expensive and it takes it takes forever and it doesn't doesn't work and <coughs> uh, everyone wants to uh, to, um, to respect human rights and <coughs> and and you have all these procedures with the the aid from the EU or from the Germans and you have to mm. check five times and you have to exactly. for sure Europe exactly. is not and it's not sexy right Europe it's mm. too no, it's, 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 it's maybe it's maybe sexy, but it's somehow. Uh, it's just complicated. It takes lots yeah. of time. It's a pain in the ass, to be frank. I mean, yeah, it's it's just it's if it's you it's want it's some it's money to finance a cultural project, I mean, it takes mm -hmm. ages. What I've heard, yeah. because they check and they recheck and they. But I think I'm not a, I'm not a geopolitician. I'm very interested by geopolitics and not at all from about Africa. But what you can see, I mean. We've been seeing this for a long time, but since the Ukrainian war and also the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, you have this huge divide between the North and the South. I mean, the South is fed up with uh, our uh, Western world, whatever it is. So you have a strong rejection. I mean, some people now in Centre Afrique prefer the Wagner Group to the French <coughs> because they have this vision. Mm. And because also the Russians were very intelligent to manipulate this. And this is what Putin talks about all the time. I mean, Europe obviously can only sustain in this incredibly dynamic world if it also is becomes a dynamic place or is a dynamic place. And one of the big challenges for this for Europe is the many people that want to live in Europe and are trying to come to Europe. Mm -hmm. And every day people are actually dying because they have a vision for Europe, for their own life, connected to Europe, and Europe lets them die in the, middle, in the, in the Mediterranean Sea. Um, on the other hand, we know by now that many people in Europe are against integrating lots of people. How, how do you feel about this? What should, what should, how should Europe react to all these people that have a European dream and want to come here and live here. I mean, it's it's a super difficult issue, and uh, all our societies are into this huge problem. I mean, it depends what you think about this European dream. I mean, I think most of the, if you take the example of the Ukrainians, uh, they're fighting because they want to be part of this. European system of values, of principles, of freedom, of liberal democracy. Um, there are also people who come for economic reasons. Why not? We all look That's for... That's what the success of America is based on. Exactly. Be an immigration country. Exactly. But Can Europe be an immigration continent? That's one of the big challenges. That's sure. a big challenge. I mean, the, the, the example I know the best, of course, is the French one. And to integrate people, you have to be... I mean, it's like dancing. You have to be two. And this is... I mean, my father comes from Tunisia, so he's also an immigrant. So I know this. And their generation, the generation of my father, uh, they really wanted to, to integrate themselves. Uh, if you want to integrate yourself, I mean, you, you need to, I mean, to make some efforts. And uh, I think if we take the example of the French, I mean, French is a good, France is a good example and a bad example because France went so far into this colonial ID, this mm. colonization thing, that you have this extremely strong love and hate relationship. If we talk about migrants from Western Africa, and especially the mm. Maghreb, and it didn't work at all. It worked for, of course, a bit, but it doesn't work. It doesn't work. So um, there are many. It's, I mean, it's extremely difficult question. I'm, I'm a writer. I'm not a. But there is also the the change, the change in Islam. 
you have a radical Islam, which is not, they don't want to integrate and they're, they're not part of the, they don't want to be part of this thing. So it's a very difficult question. I mean, we Europeans mm. didn't want to integrate some. Some Europeans didn't want to integrate these people. Some people who came didn't want to integrate. Some managed to integrate. I mean, it's extremely complex. But the question is that, I mean, look at what's going on in Europe these days for five, ten years. There is a huge majority of Europeans who don't want. I mean, the, the success of the populists that we didn't find a, an answer to this. And, in, and of course, I don't have the answer. If oh. I had the answer, I wouldn't be there, I guess. I don't know. What do you think about this? <clears throat> I'm very pro-immigration, just from the heart. Um, and I also think we need a narrative there. We need... I, th I basically agree with you that we need a completely different European narrative. And I would probably try to... try to... Um, base this narrative also on the idea that re Europe is, is an open place and not a closed place. Um, but to be a, an open place, you need to believe in something. I mean, the force of America for centuries, what, that you had this... America has a very strong narrative. And America, which is just the American dream. Woven with the my sound is stupid, but yeah. there was the American dream. Is there a European dream? Yeah, we need one. No. Yeah. I mean, yeah, Putin has a Russian dream. It's a very dark and sinister dream, but it is a dream. It is a, it is a vision. And it is a vision. Yeah, the that, Chinese that's why also people in Africa the you Chinese know, might you know, tend to, you know, because it is at least a vision. The Chinese have a vision. No. The Islamists have a vision. We don't have a vision. Uh, or a dream, just a dream. I have a question. Um, when you're talking about the narrative, and uh, and before uh, earlier before you said something about there was this uh, 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 yeah, Europe missed to find a, a narrative, something uh, some some identification, some common identification, uh, further than just be a materialistic uh, com community in a way. You said something about it that should be Christian Jewish. I I, I, I just I mean the roots. The the roots are Christian Jewish, and, and not only not only but. Yeah. Mainly, yeah. Yes. Um, so this is I, I, then I understand what you what you meant, but isn't there this? Um, uh, wasn't there at least a dream of of an open Europe? I mean, uh, some years ago, when when all the borders were, uh, when we didn't have any borders in that sense anymore, when we didn't, when we could pass from one to the other country without a passport. I mean, there was a small. I, I think it was a very small corridor, Before but it the was a, there was a time World of this open. Europe and and this unfortunately mm. kind of died because of many reasons. But so I, I there I definitely I find a definition for a kind of a European dream, the the, the 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 dream of of being an open continent. I think the um, this I, for me it's <coughs> the idea of fluidity. The idea of fluidity was at the very center of, of the European idea. The last the last decades. It was a very 68 vision, somehow, a, w a world without border or a continent without border. But <coughs> you had, um, first you had the, the migrant crisis in 15, and the border started to close because it was not a European decision. Then you had the COVID thing, and, um, and the borders uh, got closed again. Mm, now I mean it's it's open, but I think it's not enough. In fact, I think people. This is this is the consequence of this globalization thing that people, for good or bad reasons, uh, feel threatened, and the idea of opening is not enough today. People need to. Um, they have a huge identity crisis. I mean, if you go to small towns, wherever in Europe, in fact, how can these people feel that they have any impact on what's going on? I mean, if you have a factory, it might close the day after, but you don't know for, what, for which reason, why is it going, I mean, I don't know, from Germany to Hungary and from Hungary to Bangladesh and from Bangladesh. They have no idea. 
they have this idea that something is happening and they don't control it. And they also have this, um, because we, especially in Western Europe, Eastern Europe is different, but Western Europe, we decon this is what I said at the very beginning, that we deconstructed everything. And I'm not saying that we have to, to create a narrative like the nation states of Europe uh, created in the 19th century, which were more based on myth than realities. But I think we could at least try to find <coughs> a kind of common uh, transversal, uh, also a positive history of Europe. I mean, Kundera wrote amazing things about uh, European identity, for instance. Oh. And uh, I mean, the history of music, the history of arts, the history of literature, this is completely European. It's not national history. And also we have, I mean, there were big political movements uh, which you could find everywhere in Europe. The Enlightenment, uh, Romanticism. So I wanted to ask you about European books. So you would say Kundera is, is, a Europe, is, is among... It's, it's, it's funny because I read Kundera when I was young, like many people. But I'm reading Kundera again. And he still stands. I think it's amazing. Mm. Which, I think it's amazing. Which book do you like? I, I read recently L'Immortalité. Immortality. Mm -hmm. You recommend it? I think it's incredible because it's a mixture of various stories. It's also about Goethe mm. and Bettina and... Uh, immortality. That's, that's great. But, I mean, they're all the classics of the Austrian-Hungarian literature. I mean, which are truly European because it was a cosmopolitan... Um, mm. Uh, thing and um, otherwise what would I recommend as truly European I mean of course you have all the um, when I came uh, when I arrived here I uh, I took my car from Berlin to Budapest and was listening four hours of podcast about Goethe mm -hmm. and for instance Werther mm. this was a European shock for instance I mean, it had a huge impact all over the continent. This is the kind of thing that, I don't know, a theory about good, maybe it exists, I don't know. Mm. Something which, I mean, he had a very adventurous life. Or a theory about Casanova, for instance. This mm. is very European. Mm. If, if you, I watched recently again uh, Barry Lyndon. Hmm? Barry Lyndon by mm. Kubrick. This is a very European very story. European. I mean, it starts in Ireland, goes to England, then it goes to courts, various courts in Germany, Central Europe. Mm. Casanova is the same. I mean, we have lots of fantastic transversal uh, figures. These are just examples. Mm -hmm. More questions? Maybe I, I wanted to ask you again about what you mentioned um, uh, about your anthology of the mm -hmm. um, European authors. <coughs> when you said that uh, the Eastern authors had more uh, uh, a feeling of the drama of history, and the <coughs> and I, I, I don't quite understand. I don't, didn't quite understand. So, do you think in the Western, the Western authors, the West, Western European authors? Did, were not so um, moved by by this. <coughs> Do you think that is somehow this could be um, some sort of valuable hint of what some uh, this common um, this common European narrative could could be like? Um, could, would it be uh, could it be contributed uh, by uh, more from the from the from the east from the from the newer European um, culture than from the West, as the, uh, and, and particularly since you say that that, the, that that many many of the European of European tend to be some sort of r retirees. Uh, this is something that yeah I, I I didn't mention. I think one of the big mistakes of the Western Europeans in the 90s was not to recognize uh, the the sufferings of Central and Eastern Europe. Um, I mean, for, for Central and Eastern Europeans, the war ended in 1989, in fact. 
And this is a huge difference with us in the West. And um, what the Soviets, the, the Russians did was uh, they practiced cultural genocides in Central Europe. They completely destroyed the, the, the national cultures. And th that was the, the point of Kundera in this famous uh, Kidnap West essay in 83, that we are part of, we are the same culture. We have nothing to do with that. We want to be part of that. We want to come back, in fact. And um, we never, we never recognize as much as we should have, in fact, the sufferings of uh, Central and Eastern Europe. And I think that was, this is one of the main reasons of the gap, which grew and grew years after years between Eastern and, and Western Europeans. Your question was, because I think that that's an important point, um, considering, concerning the anthology, what did you ask, sorry? I was I was interested that maybe since there is this this big um, uh, um, difference or gap, <clears throat> whether you see for a for this narrative um, that is missing uh, and that we're basically we're, that we're looking and uh, asking also where it could come from, could it come from some somehow from this um, <clears throat> um, more from the Eastern European side or maybe maybe it, it comes from um, as you also mentioned, from the war uh, of Russia against against Ukraine, so that that is what I'm. Um, I, uh, I and, and of course, the, the Eastern European they have they have much more they are much more alert. Uh, sure. To this, uh, but I was looking yesterday night at a at the European poll. In fact, um, how the various populations of Europe are reacting to Ukraine two years after the beginning of the war. And the ones who are the, more, the most pro-Ukrainians are the Swedes, for instance. And the least are the Hungarians. So it's not only a matter of East, West. It's also a matter of what people, uh, what the leaders are saying to, to, to their people. I mean, it's crazy what's going on in Hungary. I mean, Hungary was invaded. I mean, Russia was always the enemy of Hungary. And uh, because of Mr. Orban, They've been brainwashed some, somehow. And now in Slovakia also. And so, so it's not only East-West. But of course, I mean, if you go to the Baltic countries or to Poland or to... They, they have this... Again, there's most of the people, except the, the youngest generations, they have this experience in their blood. They knew what it is to be occupied and what the Russians are able to do and, and so on and so on. So, of course, uh, if you take a Spaniard, I read that, so in the same article, that for the Spanish people, what's going on in the Ukraine is the 55th preoccupation. So, I mean, Europe is big. And the closer you are to Ukraine and, of course, and Russia, the... the, the, the um, but at least, I mean, the European community started to function because there was this Soviet threat. And now we again have a common threat. And Europe has, I mean, the EU has done great progress also. We have to recognize this. It shouldn't be only critical. We were talking about culture, which is missing, but mm. the, the, the Europeans moved ahead. In fact, more than without, probably, uh, the last two years. So it, uh, we also have to, to recognize this. But what is missing, again, this is what we said before, the, the change of scale, especially in the psychology of the people. People are not prepared, in fact, to this change of scale. Well, I hope that we have all you know, made a little change in our mind now and think more about the, the identity of Europe as Europeans. Or maybe not, but maybe we have one more question, yes? Of course, please. Uh, just, three minutes, yeah. just a quick one. Um, I'm just wondering, I mean, so we speak a lot about, or we've spoken a lot about the history and everything, and I'm wondering as we go forward, because in the last, in my observation, in the last couple of years, there's been a big uprising in, in, the, in, in Europe with uh, uh, young generation voices in that sense. They're, it's very present, uh, more so than 
in other parts of the world, I would assume, or, 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 or I think, and um, and I wonder, do you think that has uh, um, a positive uh, impact on the European path forward, or is it more counterproductive by giving, because it seems like the younger generations have, like, let's say, for instance, a, a Fridays for Future or something like this, right? Uh, which you may not have in other parts of the world as strong or as present in the, in the, on, the, on the political stage, perhaps, and uh, it seems like Europe, as well as the Western world, seems to be embracing this more and more. Is it, uh, is it do you, in your opinion, perhaps, is it, do you think it might be, um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, for your, in, um, what's the question, actually? Uh, um, in the in the sense counterproductive or or is it or is it a positive influence moving forward in, for the for this European idea of of unity in some sense? Or? I've to be honest, I have no idea. What I can see or I can feel, it's not it's just a feeling. I don't know, but that the the, the young generation is not attracted by the European ideas. My generation was, for instance. For them, it's normal to fly from one place to the other or to have euros in a in your wallet. It's not a dream anymore. They um, again in the early '90s when I was around 20, uh, just the idea to take a car or a train and go to Warsaw or Prague or Budapest that was amazing. That was a great adventure. Now people, they for them it's normal. It's natural. That they don't know or they don't feel what lies behind. I mean, the, the long fight, I mean, to be able to spend a weekend in Budapest just for the pleasure of taking a weekend in Budapest. There is the climate thing, which is m much more important for them. There are other issues. I mean, all the, um, the um, I mean, equality of sex and so on and so on. These are new issues that we didn't talk so much about, we didn't talk about so much, but I have the feeling that Europe uh, is not so important, but I would, I would make again a difference between the West and the East. When I published this anthology two years ago, so just at the very beginning of the war, uh, I went to 15 European countries to, to present the book, and there was a very big difference uh, among the audience in the East and in the West. In the West, most of people who came uh, for lectures, discussions, were old people. In the East, most of them were young people. Um, I think it's interesting. It says a lot, actually. And um, I think for, for young Eastern Europeans, it's because I guess they have discussed with their parents and grandparents that it's still something which is amazing, in fact. And we, we lost in the West this feeling of amazement by this freedom, this freedom of movements, this common currency, this... Uh, I mean, to move into the, the European space uh, with so much fluidity. This never happens anywhere in, in, in the world, in fact. And... Um, but the EU doesn't communicate about this. Thank you. Let's all communicate more about Europe. I thank you very much, Olivier, for thank you, Norma. sharing this thank discussion. Thank you so much. And I thank you all for coming. Now you can enjoy the, the beautiful weather. Yeah. Oh, fuck. <laughs>